everybody. Welcome to Deep um, uh, uh, Fat Fried. That's right. Welcome. Ha 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 It's a Paul episode, which apparently is the best. I don't know. I saw a poll on the subreddit that said that Paul does the best episode. So congratulations, everybody. Paul episode time. Do 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 little mixed reaction there. Yeah, there's not, and not everyone's a fan, but you know, you won. You know, here's the thing. The subreddit and Paul have a love-hate relationship. You know, sometimes they fucking, they give Paul kudos. Sometimes they shit on him. There's you see, a there's a picture of, suppo- there's there's a picture a of, of supposedly your there. dad on the uh, subreddit, by the way. There's what? There's supposedly a picture of your dad on the subreddit, by the I way. I saw that. Is it actually Is your, your dad? dad? It's my dad, yeah. Wow. I thought so. It looked it looked like you, so I was like, yeah, I think it looked that- like you I around the my eyeballs. Dad's, like sophomore yearbook picture. And which- I don't know if you noticed this, but there's like a booger. Like, whoever fucking took this picture, like, wiped a booger right next to you where your dad is. Oh, yeah. They you must not have liked him. On the yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I'm, it's whatever. Like, it's something I kind of have to expect. I'm a semi-public figure, so people are going to, like... And this dude that has this apparently lives in Madeira, and his dad went to school with my dad, so it's in his dad's yearbook that he found this. Yeah. So it's like, whatever. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't think it was... Dad. I mean, you know, yearbook is like, whatever. You know, you can't... Yeah, I've, I've actually seen that yearbook. My dad kept all his yearbooks, so when I was a kid, I flipped through them. It's like his sophomore yearbook, if I'm not mistaken, so... Oh uh, yeah. They, well, there you go. Subreddit. As you know what? Fact, you know what I found mo- most interesting about that? The amount of retarded people that thought that the person was insinuating that that was me in high school. Yeah, that was weird. Wow. Even though it's like a black and white picture and shit, and like it's like obviously totally from like it's like it turns out my dad went to shit. high school with Paul's dad. They're like, like that's, that's not that's Paul. The, that's the thread title. And then there's like eight people in the in the comments that are like. That's not Paul. What happened to him? He looks way skinny. That doesn't even look like Paul. This is fail. This is fake. I'm just like, yeah. It explicitly says that it's Paul's dad. Hey, I don't hey know Paul, you know, you know what it is, Paul? It's hypothetical truth. That's some powerful stupid right there. Jesus. All right. So we've ripped on the subreddit, but yeah, I do have a love hate relationship with the subreddit. For some reason, you know, I still go there every once in a while and read their insane ramblings. And I can confirm once and for all, because I'm not going to do it in the thread, that that is indeed my dad to settle the controversy. So there you go, subreddit. There you go. There's the love yeah. part of the love hate. Your piece is a shit, but <laughs> yeah, that's my dad. So you can quit squabbling. Um, so yeah, we're not doing an episode on OJ Simpson. What? We're going to talk about him. So no worries, Scotty. You're going to get your all chance. Right. But we're this, this kind of concept popped into my head. A lot of my shows happen this way with me. I get this thing stuck in my head, and this I got a phrase. Stuck Usually, in my it's head. a dick. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, that that I wish I wish TJ. I've never had a dick and uh, thrust into my ass or or face or whatever. Yeah, you have. Sure, Don't lie. Paul. I never have. Don't lie, oh, Paul. Okay, Paul. I'm That's a I'm right. a gay I'm a gay virgin. Okay, like well, unless you count that's shit that's like way back in the day, but time. anyway, let's not let's not get oh, whoa. <laughs> knock not get knock too. knocking on Paul's ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It All only right. hurts for but a moment, Paul. Oh my God, <laughs> this is a gone off the rails already. <laughs> All right, uh, no, ahead. but this I, I had this concept popped in, popped into my head. It was uh, the one that got away, got away. The people that just get away with shit in society, man. There must be a lot of those. And I couldn't get it out of my head. So I spent two days obsessively like pouring over the research and looking at different people uh, that have uh, gone down this road and gotten away with shit. And uh, I thought I'd so pull how, what does OJ have to do with any of this? Uh, <laughs> shut up, TJ. TJ's <laughs> going to kayfabe the OJ defender in this. I don't know what you're talking about. Defender? I mean, like, he was already found not guilty by a jury of his peers so i think that this is settled okay fine tj thank you your your point is duly noted uh-huh. and uh you don't have to repeat it ever again during okay during the show how's that uh good, sure man? i mean as long as you don't misrepresent uh what happened with oj i mean i guess that's fine okay i won't okay so once again episode is the ones who got away mm-hmm. just a group of people who uh 
uh, got away with shit. Now, my the first segment here are people who got caught, but were exonerated. Right, like OJ. Mm. And the second uh, and, uh, I'm, segment, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping that one day we can find uh, the real killer. The second segment is people who were never caught or pretty much never held responsible for what they did. Cool. Okay. So without further ado, we can talk a little bit about OJ Simpson. Is there something you want to get off your chest too about OJ, Scotty? Before we before we start, if the glove does not fit, you must acquit, dude. Mm -hmm. And I think what Paul, everyone saw that shit. Didn't fit. Didn't fit, Paul. The glove is too small. I mean, look. Yeah, I mean, whole... we saw it. I watched we it live it. on TV. It was horrifying. I mean, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a little confused why we start the episode with a man who's innocent. Because, I mean, okay. I, look, like TJ said, I mean, like, look, uh, he, he went in front of a jury of his peers. Found not guilty. You know, Scotty, well, I think I know what's going on here because uh, there are certain people of a certain lighter complexion who see a black man free to go. And, uh, you know, it just, it, I mean, obviously it's it upsets them. It On some level, it just makes them upset. Spurious. I don't know what the deal with that. This is a spurious accusation. Well, I'm not saying anything about you specifically, Paul. I'm just saying there's You're a, calling me a racist. There's, there's no, I'm just saying there's people. like, there's certain white people out there who look at O.J. Simpson, they see a free black man, and they, they get upset. Because they just want him to be, they want him to be guilty. Irrationally, you know? So, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> So I'm going to try and be as objective as possible here. Right. Sure. But let me let me I'll, let me be honest about my position in this camp. I think OJ most likely done did it. I think he had an incredibly amazing. We'll talk about why we're venturing into conspiracy like, theory wow. territory here. OK. Yes. But I'm pretty sure OJ done did it. OK. Well, so uh, the yeah. only physical evidence linking OJ Simpson to the crime was DNA evidence. Uh -huh. The volume of DNA evidence was unique. And criminalists felt they could reconstruct the crime with enough accuracy to resemble an eyewitness account. Mm -hmm. With over 100 exhibits, the defense would have to discredit all of them to establish reasonable doubt. The prosecution also produced corroborating evidence, hair follicles, clothing fibers, all of which, by the way, are not really all that great in terms of evidence. I, I will admit that. Th these last things that I'm mentioning, hair follicle evidence, um, clothing fibers and uh, fibers from the Bronco, blah, 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 blah. These, whatever. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of the evidence was planted by the uh, when they're, when they're part of racist the body police department. Of, when they're well, part so. of a body of evidence, they become significant, but th on their own, none of these would have really conclusively linked uh, Simpson to the crime. Oh, shit, Paul, I got some. But the uh, DNA, the DNA would. The DNA uh, does. Uh, well, Paul, I'm afraid I got some, we got some uh, a news flash coming in. You are fake news. You're lying, Paul. You're fa Got this is it. all fake, dude. This is all fake. Look, OJ had his day in court. Um, look, this is a, this is a tragic uh, murder that happened here. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead and go ahead and take a look at this, Scotty. As uh, you're, uh... This, this is harrowing, yeah. Paul. I, and I feel nothing but. Sympathy. And this is why I, for one, think why don't that you we help I think OJ no in his quest to find the real killer. Yeah, I think we all should fucking like start to seriously try to like. I think mean, you know this killer has been free long enough. We need to try to find the real killer, dude. I know it's a shame. Uh, because of the volume of the evidence, there were mistakes that were made during the collection of some of it, and those were highlighted and repeated <laughs> you know. during uh, cross-examination cross of their DNA witnesses. Yeah, The defense strategy in this case was basically to undermine every piece of evidence, to call into question the uh, veracity of every piece of evidence and the sanctity of every piece of evidence. Was this tampered with? Could this have been tampered with? Yeah. To never accept any blood evidence, any DNA evidence, without calling into question the very existence of it as something that was real. Right. And the people collecting that evidence, Paul. Well, and then later on, that kind of morphed into uh, a broader strategy of di not only discrediting the evidence, but implying that the evidence that was hard to discredit was planted by a racist LAPD. So that was really why O.J. Simpson got off. And I say that because I've read statements from the jury members, and I've got some of those here that I can read for you guys. Um, sure. Some of the things that uh, actual jury members in the trial have said. I'm, uh, you know, 
I don't. I mean, you know, when you when I uh, if I was going off to murder someone, you know what I do? I would put on a pair of gloves that just didn't fit. Right? I'd just be like, hey, these gloves are too small for my hands, but I'll just wear them anyway. You know, because that's that's the way I roll. You must acquit, TJ. I mean, seriously, like, you know, people make fun of this argument, but I mean, really, would you, if you're about to go murder your ex-wife, are you going to put on a pair of tiny gloves that don't even fit your big hands and walk around with this ridiculous undersized gloves? I don't think you are. I don't uh, think you are, gentlemen. Not. So and one of the most, one of the most. <laughs> out, I love OG's face here, like, they don't fit, you know. I mean, look, I know I know he's doing this with his hand, but it's because his hands just look that way, man. It's not well, that he's the, actually stretching his hands out or anything. This isn't actually the famous gloves. You can see the tag is still on these. So they yeah. fought and won a motion to have O.J. Simpson try on a brand new pair right. of the same size gloves, and this is his doing that. These gloves actually did fit him. No, they didn't. Look, mm. you can see yes, they, they don't. Did. You can see now, they he, don't. He, he tried his very best to make it look like they were ill-fitting for him. You can see that they do not fit. They actually did fit his hands You can tell fine. that the, there's, the, his fingers are not all the way in there, you know? You can but see that. The, the, in, in the famous trying on of the glove. Paul is desperate to OJ, try to make OJ case. was wearing a latex glove because of, he was handling evidence underneath. And the glove itself was very wet and had congealed and gotten all crusty and shit. And he did a fucking perfect job of just, oh, look, it won't go down over the rubber glove. There's resistance, man. It just won't pull on. Look, look. What's that fit. famous? It was, it was a fucking critical moment in the trial, and it probably won him his freedom. What's that famous saying? But that glove was perfect for his hand. It fit his hand perfectly. I, I noticed, Paul, that image has not been pulled. That's, I mean, we can. I can find it for you if you Convenient want. These gloves do not you fit his want, hands perfectly. Anyone, it? anyone with yeah. eyeballs could tell these gloves don't fit. And you know what? There's a famous fucking saying. You know, if you know someone's guilty of something, you say, you know, hey, if the glove fits. Well, in this case, the glove did not fit. You must acquit. Uh. So I want to see that. Go. All right, let's see this famous image here. So there you go. You can see once again wearing the latex glove. Pulling it don't it fit. On. He did it. He did. He did. He made a fucking great performance. Performance. I'll give him that. But the, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Why don't, maybe you just maybe you want him to do some soft shoe for you, huh, Paul? Says you just think he's a performer. He's a man on trial for his life, but he's a performer to you, huh? All right, all right, TJ. Look, I'm not. I I understand that you OJ was innocent as fuck in your mind. That's fine. I'm not trying to indict. Not in my him. mind. Saying, not in my mind. In a court of law. That a brand new pair of these same gloves clearly does not fit here. In the as same we can see. size, they don't fit, Paul. Fit his hands perfectly. No, this, Paul, those this look like they fit. Like... Look there. Look how much loose glove there is bunched can up I at the a, bottom. Can I get on? Can I? Can I get on with it? Sure. Or do you want to suck OJ's big old fucking? Yeah, it's always. It's, it must be more. sexual. It must be sexual. It is. I, oh, I guarantee it is. It must be sexual, Paul. And I'm trying to be charitable, too. I'm trying to give credit where it's due. I pulled the whole thing about how brilliant fucking Johnny Cochran was. Yeah. The, juror cl uh, the jury clearly thought so. Well, let's hear about that, Paul. Let's hear more objective. <clears throat> are you sure? Out. Are you sure you don't want to fillet O.J. Simpson a little more, TJ, or you got that out of your system? Uh, you know, I'm just trying to defend the honor of an innocent man from uh, you know, a frankly racist attack against him. But that's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> One of the most outspoken jurors after the verdict was Brenda Moran. Mm -hmm. And according to CNN, uh, during a press conference on October 4th, she said, in plain en English, the glove didn't fit. Yeah. In reference to when Simpson tried on a pair of bloody gloves in court, leading Johnny Cochran uh, to coining the now iconic phrase, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And that's actually the phrase. Right. A lot of people say, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Johnny Cochran didn't say that. He said, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit over and over and over again. That's fine. Because because he used it as a broader talking point. It wasn't just the glove. He started with the glove. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And then he went to the blood evidence. Whoa, there's a racist that collected it, though. We had him in here saying the N-word. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. It was a brilliant. If you've never heard Johnny Cochran's closing argument, it's it's a brilliant speech. Johnny Cochran. Everybody dope. should hear it. Anyway. Um Moran also said that she considered the prosecution focusing on a past incident of domestic violence between Simpson and his ex-wife, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, to be a waste of time, and said this was a murder trial, not a trial about domestic abuse. While Moran couldn't say who she thought killed Brown Simpson or Goldman, 
Uh, she said she knew it wasn't Simpson and that the verdict wasn't a matter of sympathy. It wasn't a matter of favoritism. It was a matter of evidence. See? There you go. Uh, a less press shy juror was Gina Rosenborough, who ap uh, appeared apparently on Oprah Winfrey to talk about her time on the trial. Uh, she told Winfrey that not only did she have doubts about Mark Furman from the get-go, uh, but also that she didn't think the evidence was there. If Simpson had committed such a bloody crime, then there should have been more blood in the Bronco, she said, referencing Simpson's car. Mm -hmm. So she claimed she felt the evil racism radiating off of Mark Furman when he was first called as a prosecuting uh, prosecution witness. And then when it all fell apart and there were tapes of him using the N-word and being abusive and horrible towards black people, it was basically all over. He was, <laughs> he became a symbol of failure for the prosecution. Yeah. So the question is, um, uh, now TJ, not to offend your fucking delicate sensibilities, how the fuck did OJ Simpson get away with killing his wife and her boyfriend? It's quite simple. The simplest explanation, uh, we apply Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is always uh, correct. And, uh, the wow. simplest explanation here is that he simply did not kill her. True. Okay. I think that the simplest uh, explanation is that he had a lot of money and hired these people that you see standing around here. So <laughs> from right to left, you're looking at uh, Robert Shapiro, mm -hmm. Johnny Cochran. Mm -hmm. Then you've got, uh, I believe that's Alan Dershowitz. Yes, it is. And Barry Sheck. And these were just four members of what came to be called at the time of this trial, the dream team. Mm -hmm. So... He spent a lot of money on each of these guys, and these were some of the best criminal defense lawyers that money could buy at the time. Sure. And well, he assembled all of them to be a, on his team. Yeah, I mean, you know, you the Constitution the entitles people, him to a robust legal defense. The people, I'm, absolutely. The people I'm, not, that, I'm not faulting him for it. I would have done the same the if I killed that, my fucking wife. The people that beat these kind of cases, though, are people traditionally that have lots of money, and they have a lot and they get a lot of community involvement like another, another person. Well, you might you might cover them, so I don't want to bring them up. But uh, it, it, this is just a perfect example of that. When you have this amount of money, and I mean, look, OJ, of course, is innocent as well. But th that helps. I mean, look, Paul, it, are you saying America, a country built on racism, Paul? I mean, built on slavery, arguably for a lot of it. Would not convict an innocent black man. Are you saying that, Paul? I didn't No, I'm not saying that. You're not saying okay. I, I mean, think look. it's actually happened. I think innocent black and white brown people of all color, uh, colors. All, you know all uh, all the lives, all lives matter all, rhetoric. All lives matter. Right. Yeah. But wow. there is a particular bias against black men in the fucking justice system. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just want to point that out, Paul. And, and you know, when, okay, a, fair enough. And when, and when a, a successful pillar of the black community, Paul, <sighs> goes on trial. And just happens to win with this dream team, which is the media, the media dub. Look, like, he's just trying to get the best legal defense that, that he can afford. You motherfuckers are exhausting. Oh, my God. The two of you. <laughs> What's are, exhausting you know, is, is exhausting you trying people. to relitigate this settled fucking case. I, I didn't mean I, I brought uh, I brought it up as an example because pretty much everybody knows that OJ killed his wife. And you guys are providing a litany of fucking, you know, bullshit arguments against established fucking well-known evidence. There was his DNA was all over the fucking scene. Their DNA I mean, was all was over probably, him. Because he probably went to visit. He probably went to visit before. With, and sprayed blood all over the fucking same maybe spot got, where they were killed. Maybe and he cut his hand. Have, yeah, maybe they all cut themselves and it bled on him, too, because their blood was on his Bronco and on his sock that was found in his house. That, that's crazy. And found that that in happened. fucking traces leading up the steps. And uh, who collected that evidence? What? The, the, the LAPD, the racist LAPD. That's correct. The evidence. Yeah. Oh, that just sounds like a Can we trust their chain of custody? I mean, let me ask you this. If the if the Ku Klux Klan had uh, collected the evidence, would you trust it then? The, uh, dude, the Ku Klux Klan could never have pulled off such a clandestine fucking framing of a person. So here's what happened, according to you. If you want to relitigate it, let's relitigate okay. it. Here's what happened. Here's your story. Gotcha. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Somebody, some random somebody, whoever it is, shows up, kills Nicole Brown Simpson mm -hmm. and Ronald Goldman, mm -hmm. right? The cops respond to a 911 call. Uh -huh. They immediately somehow all decide that they are going to frame O.J. Simpson for this murder, mm -hmm. yes. right? 
Sounds they right. get a hold of his a vial of his blood somehow. Nobody's explained how they got his blood before this, mm -hmm. but they did. They got his blood, right? They got a bunch of O.J. Simpson's blood. Right. They mm -hmm. sprinkled it all over the goddamn crime scene. They sprinkled it all over the Bronco, and they sprinkled it all over the doorway leading up to his house. They yeah. planted a bloody glove, of which there was a receipt, by the way, for him buying it. So they somehow got his glove. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, this is all on the fly with no plan. Yeah. They somehow got his gloves, soaked it in the blood of the victims and a little bit of his own, and then threw it uh, behind a fucking uh, uh, thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, a thing. Threw it behind the fucking guest house Yeah. where Cato heard it. Right. Then they went inside of OJ's house mm -hmm. while, according to the defense, he was still home. Right. And planted... A bunch of blood and the bloody sock in OJ's hamper upstairs. Mm -hmm. Possibly like wounded OJ because he had a, a, a wound that was consistent with a wound that you would get from fucking stabbing somebody and that slips and it cuts your finger. He had a wound on his index finger right here. Mm -hmm. Like he stabbed somebody and hit him a little too hard or hit some bone and his finger slipped off the guard and cut itself. Right. So they did that to him too or made sure that that happened. Right. Then they also made OJ flee from custody with his friend. Mm -hmm. They somehow, I don't know, maybe they used a mind control ray. Yeah. When it was clear that he was about to go down for the murder that he clearly committed. Because he was innocent, Paul. Mm -hmm. because he was oh, innocent. because he was innocent. Now let Paul, let Paul finish, Scotty. All right, fine, fair enough, fair enough. All right. And then on top of all of that, they were able to pull off the greatest fucking planting of evidence in history. Mm-hmm with no foreplanning at all mm -hmm. on the fly mm -hmm. wrong, and uh, actually have it work. Okay. So I, I guess, uh, I guess I was wrong. Cause uh, Paul, Paul clearly does understand what happened. Um, yeah. That sounds about right. Whatever. I will be right back. You guys can stroke <laughs> off to fucking how not guilty fucking. And you Mojo know what, you know what I like, find is crazy is uh, a leak. Okay. Oh, that's, that's good. Um, you know, what's crazy is, uh, OJ is uh, I I I'm, I'm, I follow OJ on Twitter and I haven't really seen him trying to find uh, the real killer. I think I should write to OJ and uh, let him know that I'm willing to help, help find the the real killer of Nicole and uh and uh, what's the other guy, Goldman? Uh, Goldman? Ron Ron Goldman. Was it Ron yeah. Goldman? Yeah, I think it's Ron Goldman. Yeah. Like that. Well, we need to find the we need to find the real killer. Look, can I give you an alternate version of what happened, TJ? Sure. The real version? Yeah, the real version. I mean, okay, Paul's look. version sounded pretty plausible, but go ahead. Look, someone LAPD, probably some <laughs> higher up, maybe in the police chief, just didn't like OJ. Maybe he, he fucking was on a fucking charity event and OJ snubbed him or something. Like, right. no, I'm busy. I got I, I to gotta meet with my adoring fans. Like, you're just, you're some big shot. I want to meet with the people. OJ goes to a doctor's appointment. They get a bunch of his blood, right? Yeah. LAPD sends a probably a police officer, probably the one even on the stand here, uh, Mark Furman, takes him out, mm. takes OJ's blood, which they've taken surreptitiously from a doctor's office, sprinkles all over the scene of the crime. Also, at the same time, they've broken into OJ's house, stolen the bloody socks, stolen all this other evidence that they're, they're so the so called evidence that we're going to see later. Yeah, that comes out. That is, of course, sprinkled with blood. Uh, Sprinkle the killer some blood. gets. A, yeah, the killers of course, of course gets the blood from those victims, puts it on puts it on OJ's Bronco, puts it in you know, places in OJ's house. Is everybody in the LAPD is uh, is everybody in the LAPD in on it immediately too? Uh, I don't know how many people are actually in on it, Paul. I mean, that, well, because like, out, but, because, well, but, like here, so several. like Dennis, Dennis no, no, Fung. no, 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 no. You, you don't get to tell your version, then interrupt every oh. five seconds of mine. Okay, fine, fine. Look, fair but enough, uh, fair enough, Scotty. I don't know how fair many enough, people, but, but but we know at least. I would say at least probably three to five people. Fair enough, Scotty. But but but, uh, but I would say that's a minimal number. The whole LAPD potentially, we don't know. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. all that evidence is planted. Mm -hmm. uh, I also I'm, I'm looking up some other evidence here, and it says here that uh the shoes, the shoe prints at the scene of the crime were a uh, uh -huh. size eleven and a half mm -hmm. uh, okay. shoes, and OJ's wears a size twelve. <sighs> so. There you go. It's a half a another, shoe size, two another piece of evidence. The shoes at the Close. scene. The look, shoe, Paul, when OJ uh, fled in small. the Bronco, I'm at, Paul, imagine you were in a nightmare. Imagine you're in a world where there's a crime you did not commit, Paul. What would you do? You know the police are coming for you. You're just going to say, you know what? I just got, just take me in. I know I'm innocent, but you know what? No, Paul, 
You get into your car if right I'm now innocent, and you fucking if flee. If I'm innocent, I would turn myself in immediately. No, you wouldn't, Paul. You flee. Get, get a lawyer and fight it. You flee, Paul. You no, I wouldn't. Flee. You get you get into your car, Paul, and you fucking get out of there. After you get out of there, Paul. Bag filled with questionable items Paul. to somebody to dispose for me. If you know, if you thought the justice system would be stacked against you, you would just, you would literally just trust in it. If you know, like, no, man, this is... no, I'll tell you what I would do, Scotty. The first thing what I would, would you do, do? Is I would round up a bunch of items. <laughs> now, if you ask me what these items are, I'm not going to tell you what these items are, but it's a bunch of items that fit into a, like a duffel bag, right? Yeah. And then I'm going to take these items to a loyal friend of mine and tell him, get rid of this shit. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I'm going to tell another friend of mine, hey, come pick me up, man. And I'm going to fucking leave when I've already told the, the prison that I'm coming to relinquish myself to custody. And I'm going to lead the LAPD on a retarded, like, 12-hour chase around L.A. Well, not only did he know he's innocent, Paul, but he probably feared being killed by LAPD. Just so enraged that he comes out of his house. He was threatening to kill himself. Because he knew that, look, Paul, he knew he needed that media attention to even survive. If he was afraid of being killed by the LAPD, why do we have recordings of him from inside the car saying, like, I'm going to do myself in. I don't want to hurt none of y'all. Because, so because he doesn't want not only the officers to get hurt, even though they're trying to kill him. He cares. He, he's so deeply empathetic. He doesn't want to do that. He's even thinking about taking this. I'm like, look, I admit he, he probably said he was, he was thinking about that, Paul. Probably because he knew he was going to get railroaded by the legal system. There's like, no he, probably about it. He said it with his own mouth. We have There's recordings of him saying it. No, I'm explaining the reason. He probably knew that he was about to get railroaded. He was about to have an unjust Absolutely. system come in, swoop down after he knew the evidence had been planted against him, after he knew these racist cops hated him. He knew Wasn't he had no chance. you guys that invoked Occam's razor earlier? Yeah. <laughs> Where did that, that was go? TJ. Where did that go, where that TJ? Go? Where did Occam's Razor Occam's go? Razor. trying to give you a plausible Occam's Razor is – Occam's Razor applies here. Look, he was not guilty. That's the simplest explanation for why he was not convicted of this crime. Yes. A jury of his peers. Look, All right. his, the Let's shoes – Not only on. did the I glove not fit, like, the honestly, shoes don't fit. OJ was not even in Los Angeles at the time of the murder. Uh, the uh, phone records uh, uh -huh, were uh – -huh. Yeah, TJ. The phone records yeah, show that no, Nicole no, no, was right, talking to her right. mother when OJ was already yeah. on a flight to Chicago. Uh, 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 he was innocent, guys. Uh, he was innocent. It's fine, TJ. There Can was defensive wounds on the knuckles of uh, Goldman, and there were uh -huh. no corroborating injuries to OJ Simpson. I mean, there's tons of evidence against this proposition that OJ is guilty. I mean, it's ridiculous to claim that he is. All right. Well, whatever you hey, want to die on that fucking hell, TJ. You go right ahead. I hope you. I hope you donate some money to OJ Simpson to help him find those killers. I TJ. think I will. I'm gonna go donate to the uh, the fund right now. So I'm I'm really hoping you guys are gonna drop the fucking kayfabe <laughs> defense of obviously guilty people for this one. But if you're not, take a look at Casey Anthony here. I don't remember. I don't know anything about this case. So I don't. Know. <laughs> I don't know how to defend uh, this. I, I'm not a. I'm you not made a bunch of videos about it. Back no, I made. In the day. I made one. I made one video about it to to you. <laughs> I don't remember making any others. I'll kayfabe defense for OJ. I don't think I want to kayfabe <laughs> defense for someone that killed their own kid. I think I'm good. Who's oh, the, don't you mean an innocent woman, Scotty? A totally innocent, totally Paul, if that, if that, woman. If that's, a, if that's a tact you want to take, Paul, I personally would never do that myself. I defend only innocent people. Yeah. So Casey Anthony. I don't know if she did it or not. I mean, I was I didn't pay attention to this trial too much, so. This was big news in the earlier 2000s, but most uh, people probably don't remember much T about it. TJ, when you hear the evidence, uh, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, let's it's, hear it. It's, it's, it's pretty damning. Uh, in October 2008, Casey Anthony was charged with first-degree murder just months before her daughter's skeletal remains were found in a trash bag. One question that people still ask about this trial, though, is how did Casey Anthony get off? For those who may not remember, uh, Casey was acquitted after being found not guilty of first-degree murder, aggra aggravated manslaughter, and aggravated child abuse, while she was found guilty on four counts of providing false information to law enforcement. Uh, so go to the next picture there, TJ. Sure. <clears throat> this is Kaylee Anthony, the victim. She was two years old at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, her remains were found in the woods a short distance away from her grandparents' Orlando house, and no one had been made uh, to answer. And still, to this day, no one has been made to answer for her killing, her obvious death mm -hmm. uh, by murder. 
Uh, similar to how there seemed to be a surplus of evidence to investigate the murder of John Benet Ramsey in 1996, which I could have, you know, pulled as well for this. Uh, yet ultimately, the dozens uh, of pieces of evidence never came together to create a cohesive enough picture of what happened and so piled up the evidence surrounding Kaylee's death. So that's she got off basically the same way that fucking OJ got off. She had a really good attorney that was able to poke enough reasonable doubt holes in what was otherwise a very strong case for her involvement in the death of her daughter and get her acquitted of it, basically. Also, some serious investigation errors. Because I mean, like, once again, the same thing happened in fucking OJ's case, too. There was er, there were errors in the collection of some of the fucking DNA evidence in fucking OJ's case. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get to the probably the search history stuff. Or did you not pull that? I don't know if I pulled a ton of fucking information, but yes. Uh, well, apparently she used um, Firefox, and the dumbass people investigating her only checked her Internet Explorer or some other thing history. They didn't actually check all her Internet histories. And on, and on the Internet history they, they actually did not search was, like, how to strangle, uh, like, a child or something. It was something like that. How to get rid of a body or some shit. Yeah, it, it was shit like that. It was shit like, if you were looking up, it was like, uh, I don't think she realized where she was, that there was a history of this stuff she was looking up. And she was really looking up, like, how to kill a child. Uh, the defense never tried to argue that Casey was a saint or otherwise blameless, while the prosecution painted a picture of an evil woman who murdered her daughter, got rid of the body, and went about her life for a month before Kaylee was reported missing. Uh, even entering a hot bod contest at a club just days after Kaylee died. Uh, the defense maintained it was an accident. In panic, Casey and her father, George Anthony, disposed of Kaylee's body. So they try to claim that, like, Kaylee died by misadventure. Everybody panicked and got rid of the body. That was the defense case. So they didn't really deny, like, that they got rid They didn't deny that no. they got rid of the body or anything. They just denied, like... She died the evidence causes. was fucking ridiculously overwhelming. There right. Was so there was no way to deny that, been... like, you did. they did it. They just had to, yeah. like, be like, well, okay, we did dispose of the body and cover it up, but, you know, it was just because we were scared. So once, so once again, in trying to answer the question, how did she get away with it, we go to the jury once again. I think that's the, because they are the people that exonerated her. So I found some quotes from jurors in this case. Uh, one juror, Jennifer Ford told ABC News at the time, I did not say she was innocent. I just said there was not enough evidence. If you cannot prove what uh, the crime was, you cannot determine what the punishment should be. Okay. Uh, after 90 witnesses and 33 days of testimony in the courtroom, the jurors began to deliberate. Uh, same juror, Jennifer Ford, says, we took a vote on the four charges of lying to the police, uh, one male juror said, and it came back uh, 12 to 0 to convict. That didn't take long at all, so... They all agreed immediately that she had lied a bunch of times to the cops. Right. Uh, we took the first vote on first degree murder, said the juror. We were 10 to 2 to acquit. So we talked for about 30 minutes, and the two decided that they were willing to change their votes. So first degree was off the table pretty quickly. Okay. Um, so basically, there were two holdouts in the first vote, and then they caved in 30 minutes, and they were like, nope, she's innocent on the first degree murder. I mean, it sounds like, uh, based on what Scotty was saying, that it was definitely first degree, but if that evidence wasn't presented at trial, then, like... It wasn't. How would the jury know that? By by the way, all of what I'm reading at this point and have just been reading is, quote, a direct quote from a juror that sat on the panel. So take right. that for what it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so next up on the, on the docket was aggravated manslaughter. Okay. She faced that charge as well. We did our first vote, and it came out half. Half and half. Okay. Half 50, to acquit. 50, half to, convict, to acquit gotcha. and convict. Uh, and we talked about it for a while, going through the evidence. Uh, I'd say that people got it got intense, but there were no real personal attacks, no real yelling. And we talked for a while, and then it was 11 to 1 to acquit. And the guy who didn't want to uh, quit basically looked at us and said, okay, whatever you all want. He knew he wasn't going to convince us. <laughs> so he's basically the opposite of the uh, main <laughs> character in 12 Angry Men. Yeah. You know, but the inverse. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Um, and then we sat there for a few minutes and we were like, holy crap, we're letting her go free. He continued. Everyone was just stunned at what we were about to do. One of the women jurors asked me, are you okay with this? And I said, hell no, but what else can we do? We promised to follow the law. 
Despite the decision to acquit Anthony, the jurors later said that their decision haunted them. Right. Because <clears throat> they're a bunch of dupes, clearly. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, they, it sounds uh, to me like the, I mean, I can't really blame them. I mean, it sounds to me like the fucking uh, prosecution presented a really shitty case. Like they didn't even show the evidence of the search history where she's like looking up how to get away with this and shit. They just failed to counter the narrative that the defense came up that this. I mean, look, was it, it sounds like everyone on this jury knew this bitch was guilty, but they're like, but there is reasonable doubt. So we, by the fucking letter of the law, we cannot convict her. Right. So, um, juror number three, Jennifer Ford, once again said to ABC News about the convict or the exoneration of uh, Casey Anthony. We were sick to our stomach to get that verdict. Uh, we were crying, and not just the women. It was emotional, and we weren't ready. Another female juror told People in 2012 that she was plagued with questions after the trial. I did what I could do based on the evidence of what we got to hear, she said. But the people watching at home could see the sidebars and the commentary, and they knew way more about the case than we did. I hated being on that jury. I wish I hadn't been, but I don't know what else I could have done. <laughs> so they're ba they're basically saying that like after they got out and looked at the shit that they weren't allowed to see and the evidence the that shit wasn't that didn't allowed make it because to trial. the prosecution sucked at fucking defending itself and pre presented a shitty fucking prosecution. They thought it was going to be a slam dunk and they treated it all flippantly. Look, when you go to a court of law and you're, and you're talking about a trial like this, it's the defense's narrative and the prosecution's narrative. If the defense makes a way more compelling narrative, that's what's going to win the day. And, and you hear this all the times in these trials. Like, you hear people come out of it, and, like, a year later, a month later, even, like, fucking a few days later, they're like, wow, we made the wrong fucking decision. And this I is actually, clearly a case of that. I actually have some experience. Uh, you guys know I sat on a jury for eight months yeah. once. Oh, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, no. Um, I sat on a jury for like eight months and it wasn't a murder trial or anything. It was a civil fucking trial, but it, it gave me insight into how in the dark the jury is kept. Most of what happened in that trial was done outside of the jury. We didn't get to hear most of the arguments that were made. All of that stuff was done outside of us, and we were given a very carefully argued set of evidence to deliberate with. We didn't get the whole picture, and I think that's by design. It's to prevent one one argument or narrative from unfairly advantaging itself over the other. But I can very much attest to the feeling of being in the dark about a lot of what's going on in the case as a juror because you're kept so sequestered from it. That's true. Well, I you're, think what they're really trying to keep vacuum. The, I think what they're really trying to keep the jurors away from more than anything is like, you know, especially in a big case like this, obviously, is like the emotionality that gets involved. <laughs> And well, obviously, not only that, but they're trying to keep them away from the commentary, right? The sensationalism and like they don't want the, you don't you don't want the jurors to fucking watch like a Nancy Grace segment on the fucking trial or something. Like shit, even in my know? case, we were admonished. Now we weren't sequestered, right? We were allowed to go home and sleep at home, but we were admonished to not read any look because it it involved the school district locally, so the local papers were covering it, right? So you're basically and, told, like, stay the fuck away from the right, local news. Don't read, don't read any stories. If you're going through the paper and you see a story about this, skip it. Like, that's your civic duty to not allow commentary outside of this court about the particulars of this case. Right. <laughs> now, most of the jurors on my fucking case didn't take that seriously, but jurors in this case were not given the, the uh, right. opportunity. Like a high-profile case like this, they fucking sequester these people. Right. These people are kept in a hotel room. Now... It's not impossible for that shit to leak into a sequester. Sure. It, ha it happens pretty often. But they are kept from most of the fucking constant drumbeat of commentary that people outside of the case are seeing. Yeah, they're not going to see the Nancy Grace segment. They're not going to see Glenn Beck's fucking opinion or whatever the fuck, you know. At least not every goddamn night and everybody else's opinion besides, you know. Like, they might sneak in a magazine that has an article or some shit. They might see a newspaper they shouldn't see. They might get a phone call they shouldn't get on a burner phone that they had snuck in. This is all this shit happens in sequestered juries. Sure. So. But for the most part, they're kept from it anyway. Um, so that basically is um, what I pulled on Casey Anthony. If you're interested in the more particulars of her case, I think a whole episode could be done like on OJ too, you know, like um, it's an interesting case. A lot of people feel that justice wasn't served after looking at the evidence and after, with the benefit of hindsight, of course, 
Yeah, of course. Because shit came to light after the trial, too, that just was even more damning. Uh, like what Scotty mentioned, that fucking uh, browser history. history from Firefox didn't come out until after she was already acquitted. I mean, it's just a crazy thing. And I think it was one of those cases where it's like you look at it and it's like even the people on it were like, wow. I mean, in a vacuum. How to strangle my daughter and get away with yeah. it. Yeah, it's like, in a, it, it, but you're, like you said, it's in a vacuum. And if and if and like in like a case like this, there's so much media attention. They're just trying to really keep people like you know kind of cloistered away from it. And then, but you see, but, but after that uh, fact, I mean, of course, it's easy to see. I mean, if you look at her, I mean, her guilt is pretty clear. I mean, they even said like, oh, well, she lied to the police. I mean, it was just one of those cases where it's like you know the defense made such a good and compelling argument to them. They're like, you know what, she probably did it, but. There's that doubt, and we do have that doubt because of whatever that you know the yeah. defense brought up. I mean, this was the prosecution's case to lose, and they dropped the ball clearly. Oh, com they didn't, completely. They didn't. They didn't argue well enough in the sidebars. They didn't get enough evidence in. They didn't pursue this in the right way. They didn't take it seriously enough, and because of that, a murderer, basically a child murderer, is f free to free to walk around. Yeah. Um. So there's that. Uh, go ahead and go to the next picture, TJ. Okay. You guys recognize this guy? No. Mm -mm. He, he was in the media for a little while. You guys remember the term affluenza? Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. This is the affluenza guy. Yeah, I did a video Ethan, about this dude. Yeah, Ethan Couch. Yeah, I didn't remember his name or I guess what he looked like, but yeah, I remember the affluenza case. So in 2012, a Fort Worth police officer drove by a Dollar General store in Lakeside, a small town on the outskirts of Fort Worth, and saw a black pickup truck parked with its lights on. Mm -hmm. um, Spakes, the officer, found an intoxicated couch with a girl. Couch being this guy's last name, not an actual intoxicated couch. That would be <laughs> yeah, insane. That it's like an episode of Family Guy or something. So he found Ethan Couch drunk with a girl in this truck. Uh -huh. According to court records, uh, Couch told Officer Spakes that he'd stopped to pee and only had one drink, maybe two. Spakes described him as very arrogant, a smart-mouthed kid that had a bit of an attitude with authority. Uh huh. I verbally got on to him for trying to get him to see how badly he was messing up, Spakes wrote, wrote in his report. He has a hard time listening, and he comes from a family with wealth. He appears to believe he's privileged and entitled with no responsibility. It's all taken from Officer Spakes's report of this incident. Right. Um, I verbally got on to him trying to see how badly he uh, he was messing up. Oh, but, sorry, I read that. Yeah, yeah um, I read that one. <clears throat> Couch eventually acknowledged his behavior was wrong, Spakes wrote. Yet, uh, when a second officer, Lee Risden of the Lakeside Police, handed Couch a citation, the teen replied, thanks for ruining my life, as though it was the fault of the police, according to the report. So his being drunk and driving around was, you know, goddamn fucking police, thanks for ruining my life. <laughs> I'm just out of here driving drunk, man. He's a weird looking motherfucker. Too. He's got no he chin, dude. He doesn't uh, have a he's chin. Got the Habsburg jaw, dude. Yeah. All these rich people are inbred. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how Paul just like will drop some shit like that on there sometimes. Yeah, all these rich fucks are inbred. Everyone knows that. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's it's ver it's verifiable truth. Anyway, um, so Couch, uh, let's see, a month later, a, mun a municipal judge gave Couch six months proba probation for possessing and consuming alcohol as a minor. The judge also ordered him to complete an alcohol awareness course and 12 hours of alcohol-related community service. So he kind of threw the book at him. A little bit. And he wasn't really let off by his privilege in this case. Uh, yeah, records I mean indicate that Couch did not comply, however— and uh, four days before the deadline, he organized a party at the family's second home outside the Fort Worth sub suburb of Burleson. And that it's that party that would actually lead to death. Yes. So on June 15th, 2013, Couch lost control of his family's pickup truck after he and his friends had played beer pong and drank beers they'd uh, stolen from a Walmart. He's rich as fuck. Right. But steals the beer that they get. Well, he's a minor on. still at this point, right? So, of course. He can't legally buy it. They, you're telling me that, like, a rich dude doesn't know somebody that would buy him beer? You That's can't true. Pay, Easily. Pay some guy a hundred bucks to get you beer. Yeah. So, anyway, whatever. I think it just kind of speaks to his 
thinking he could get away with anything. Um, he veered into a crowd of people who were trying to help the driver of a vehicle that had broken down on the side of the road. The crash fatally injured the stranded, mo the stranded motorist, a youth minister who stopped to help her, a mother and her daughter who came out uh, of their nearby home to try and help. Hmm. So a bunch of good Samaritans and the person who just had a breakdown all die. Yeah, he just he just fucking uh, knocks them down like bowling pins, basically. Just poof. yep, yeah. Uh, Couch, While who drunk. was sixteen at the time of the crash, was found to have a blood alcohol level three times the legal limit for adult drivers. Right after the crash, uh, investigators estimated his speed was around seventy miles per hour in a forty mile per hour zone. Mm -hmm. So okay. he's way in excess. So here's what happened in his trial. A psychologist who evaluated Couch in 2013 introduced the term affluenza in trial as a reference to Couch being coddled by his wealthy parents. He got on the stand and testified that Couch learned nothing from any of the incidents that had come before this, getting caught drinking, getting excited, going to the classes. Um, the teen didn't think he had done anything wrong. Uh, Dr. Uh, G. Dick Miller who's this Dick psychologist Miller. said G Dick Miller G Dick Miller uh and his mother and his father had lied about it or and his mother lied to his father about it so his dad didn't even know that this had happened his mom had covered it up typical like rich privilege shit mhm mm uh couch also kept abusing substances miller testified i think he thought i can get away with this that's what he was taught Miller uh, recommended that Couch be separated from his parents, whom he said had taught him a system that's 180 degrees from rational. If you hurt someone, say you're sorry. And that family, if you hurt someone, send some money. Couch got probation. Affluenza. Uh, now, because he's a stupid fuck, he eventually did do some prison time. But because he violated that probation. So he gets away with killing four people. Four people drunkenly, gets nothing but probation, and then he violates that probation. Uh, he was jailed after he attended a party where alcohol was served, and then he fleed to Mexico with his mom to avoid punishment. Uh, he'd served some prison time, and he eventually was released in 2018. He served uh, nearly two years on the probation violation. Mm hmm. And attempt to flee justice. <laughs> so he is a fucking paid idiot. no price for the death of these four people. And the only prison time that he ended up serving was because he was too stupid to not get drunk and flee the country. Yeah. I love it. I love how they're like, look, guys, I mean, the affluenza thing is so self defeating because it's just like, look, he thinks he's, he's, he's rich, so he thinks he can get away with anything. So I think that we got to let him go with this, you know? So, like, yep. you yeah. let him get away with something because he's so rich that he thinks he's going to get away with it. Well, you just confirmed that he's fucking right. So it's, it's not bullshit. even... Anyways, dude, Ugh. affluenza is not a fucking thing. They hired a fucking psychologist to fucking make some shit up. It sounded plausible to a bunch of dumbasses. Like, look, he's got this bad disease. It's not his fault that he killed the people. It's like, no, he got drunk. He didn't give a shit. And he was driving down the fucking road with his buddy's party. But he had a diminished care. sense of consequence due to being rich, Scotty. Yeah. Gee, I wonder where he got that from. Clearly. Clearly, that's the case. And the only reason this guy ever saw a fucking jail cell was because he's so fucking stupid. He can't just stay away from a fucking party for a, fucking, for a little while. Oh, I'm on probation. I can't do that. And he fucks up again. Oh, and he goes to fucking, and the only he goes to fucking jail or prison is because he's fucking stupid. It's, it's Wisely grew like a beard to hide that weak chin, too. Well, Whatever. I mean, he did. So you got to give him that. Yeah, he at least figured that out. <laughs> so we're going to move on, gentlemen. Hold the from, mic, stone from, boy. Uh, what basically amounts to three people who were caught for what they did and then exonerated. Uh, a lot of people would ar argue falsely or in a way that did not meet justice. Some of us would argue uh, uh, differently, I guess. Yeah, OJ <laughs> but, was um, innocent, obviously. But the other two, I guess, were pretty guilty. So, 
Fair whatever. enough. Um, these are people who are never caught or never held responsible if they were. And the first is a weird one. Have you guys ever heard of the Stone Man? No. Yeah, uh, hold the mic, Stone Man. Stone boy grew up, man. He's now the stone man. Hold the mic, stone man. Uh, no, I haven't heard of stone man. Sounds cool. So it's cool. an Indian uh, killer. So there was once a, a person in India in the 80s okay. who was named the stone man by a popular English print media in Calcutta. Okay. Uh, allegedly, he killed uh, at least 13 people. And the upper limit of the number is 26 sometimes. So he killed between 13 and 26 people. Yes. Mostly homeless people, uh, beggars, rag pickers, in their sleep with nothing but stones. Oh. Sometimes uh, the stones were super heavy. I don't know. Scotty's probably the best at this. What's 30 kilograms, Scotty? It's like 90 pounds. That's pretty fucking heavy. 90 pound rocks. So basically, he would uh, find a he or she. Sixty six pounds, exactly. It's it's, it's how much? Well, sixty six point one oh, three well, eight six okay. eight. Six. But basically, so, sixty six pounds. Still a heavy ass. That's a heavy ass stunt. I mean, like I can't. I mean, I guess I can lift sixty six pounds. But I mean, that's a heavy ass. I mean, you can see one right ass. there. That's a fucking big fucking stone. Yeah, this is one of and the basically, victims. So he'd walk up to sleeping fucking beggars on the street, holding the big ass stone, and just smash it down on them. Just throw it on their heads and crush their heads with it. Damn. Yes. Stone Man is uh is hardcore, dude. Hey, yeah. you know what? At least they were sleeping. Yep. Yeah, they never they probably never knew what, what happened. So I uh, guess that's something. So I guess psychopathy doesn't need motives. Um around nineteen eighty five there were signs of homeless people being killed in their sleep in the streets of Mumbai, then Bombay, India. When police found at least 12 murders within a span of two years with the same pattern, in most of the cases, the victims were well-researched upon by the killer, and he chose only those who didn't have many relatives or friends. He preferred to sleep uh, alone. So they kind of did a profile on him and found out these facts about him and what, how he chose his victims, and it wasn't random. Like, he would follow these homeless people, and, like, he picked specific ones that... So he made he sure he picked ones vulnerable. that... There's not going to be a family agitating for the police to solve the crime or any of that shit. He wants people when that... They, when they investigated this, they thought they were going to find some a, a crime of opportunity, but they found evidence to the contrary. They found very carefully planned crimes. Right. So this person is, is very meticulous. He's choosing uh, his victims based on... how I mean, like, he's choosing it based on getting away with it. Because, I mean, like, you kill homeless people, you kill beggars and shit... Uh, you know, society, I'm assuming, you know, even uh, our, even today in this society, that's not going to be taken too seriously. I don't know what the politics of India were at the time, but, you know, you kill the, the, the lowest rung members of society and people tend to not give as much of a shit. Well, it's something that serial killers tend to do. They tend, I mean, not, not always, but they tend to find people that in a lot of cases, no one's really going to mess. No one's going to come ask any questions about. So it's like, oh, if they're dead, it was some drifter. Who cares? So, um, at least 12 murders within a span of tw uh, two years were attributed that had this pattern. Uh, in most cases, the victims were well, re uh, like I said, well, well researched by the killer. Uh, further adding to the horror, the same pattern of crime was again noticed when the murders resumed after stopping in Mumbai, in Kolkata, which was then Calcutta, India. Mm -hmm. uh, the summer of 1989 was gruesome for the residents of that city. 12 more people died in a similar manner, uh, a blow to the head by a huge stone or a big concrete slab. Uh, the Kolkata police did a massive deployment of policemen, caught some suspects. They were arrested, interrogated, never found anybody that fit the bill, never were able to pin anything on anybody. Uh, despite all these efforts, the stone man never came to light. And uh, may very well still be out there. If he was a younger man when he did this, I mean, he would be about my age now. So the stone man might still be out there. And he's become kind of an urban legend, I guess, in these towns. Anytime a homeless person is killed, people will say, oh, the stone man is back. Um, to date, no one knows what he even looks like. Uh, there have been many serial killers in history, but there's only a few that have managed to really get away with what they did and 
Uh, thus far, the stone man is one of them. I think it's because the MO is so simple and the victims so carefully chosen. Now, obviously, yeah. even with the even though he did choose, you know, beggars and people who sleep in the streets, um, eventually there was some serious investigative resources put into this. So um, the, I, I read a but, little bit more about this and I didn't pull uh, the information, but I can say that, like, it's disputed amongst uh, Indian investigators and authorities whether or not the uh, crimes in the two cities I mentioned, Mumbai and Calcutta, were actually connected or perpetrated by the same person. I feel they like the pattern. I feel like they almost had to have been just because it's such a unique mo for a fucking serial killer. Right. Like it's not some like you don't hear about this method of murder too often. You know what I mean? Like I right. guess you know th there's a precedent for like copycat killers and stuff. So it could have been someone who heard about the original thing and was like, "I'll do that myself." But or it could have been it, moving it, locations. Right, but it, it really just kind of seems like, it, 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 I don't know, my guess would be it's the same person, not that my guess really counts for much, just because of the uniqueness of the MO. Yeah, and, uh, you know, like I said, because this person was never brought to light, there's a possibility that they were picked up on some other crime and ended up in the system anyway. The possibility that they died, maybe they were way older, and, you know, maybe they were in their 40s when they were doing this, so they died Yeah, I mean, um, there's a, they couldn't have been, t I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's some pretty strong old people out there, but you know, we're talking about a pretty strong person to I be can, able I to can still lift a 66 pound rock and crush somebody's head with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I'm 40, you're so. invalid or whatever, but you know, I mean like six, no, I'm just saying like, you know, it, it's possible that a man, a big dude could do this sure. into his forties or even his fifties. So, yeah. but it, you know, if he was a younger person, if it was a teenager, even he'd be younger than he'd be like Scotty's age now. Well, no, he's, you said he killed well, him. No, he, you said he, he killed him in the 80s, so he'd be 82. Right. No, yeah, 82 80 through 89 is when he was active. Right. So, I mean, if he was killing the 80s, he'd have to at least, even if he was like 20, then he'd have right. to be, you know, like uh, 50. He'd 50 be 50 or 60 now. So, yeah. 60, yeah. So, but he could still be alive. No, he, he, he definitely could. Still be out Maybe there. not capable of doing this anymore. Maybe he's done it a bunch of times and it's just never been attributed to him. And he just kept on being careful about it. Could have changed his modus operandi, could have died, could have gone to jail yep. for some unrelated crime. But uh, definitely, uh, thus far, got away with it. Uh, go ahead and go to the next picture, TJ, if you don't mind. As far as we know, though. You guys recognize this gentleman? His his attire should tell you a little something about him. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's definitely a Nazi. I, I recognize right. the, the, the skull thing on his hat there. Not a super well known Nazi, so I don't really expect uh, either of you to know this. Yeah, guy's I don't. Name. I don't know who. I don't know yeah, his I'm name or anything. I'm drawing a blank. I've probably seen this picture before, but I don't know. A high ranking Nazi, but not a super well known Nazi. This is Walter Rauf. Rauf. So he, he was born in 1906 in Germany. Rose quickly through the Nazi military and uh, party ranks in the lead up to World War II, and became responsible for the deaths of around 100,000 Jewish, Roma, and disabled people in Eastern Europe. North Africa and Italy between uh, 1942 and 1945. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, he's that's basically the the number that they've come up with when they try to at attribute deaths to directly to this guy and his orders and things that were done right. under his orders. About a hundred thousand people. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, crazy. A lot more than Stone Man. Criminal. Excuse me. Um. Following Hitler's invasion of Poland, uh, Ralph was in a suitable position to exert influence and implement ideas such as the adoption of the mobile gas chamber, which would be used to exterminate predominantly Jewish, but also Roma and disabled people. Ralph was uh, a leading figure behind the Nazis' use of mobile gas vans, which would basically, guys would run out, they'd trap people in the back of them, and then use the fumes from the exhaust pipe to kill them. Right. Fuck. So they had it specially rigged vans that exhausted into the fucking back of them, and they would just see a Jewish couple like this. This is a couple of Roma people. Um, just toss them in the back of the van, drive around for a minute. Earlier picture. This is from like the earlier 1900s, but this is the you know the kind of uh, this is the target kind though. of ethnic group they were targeting. Gotcha. With a lot of this, but they would drive up with a van and just throw these people in the back at gunpoint, and then drive around in it, and they'd die drop the bodies off and just keep doing it. And so that was really how he did most of his killings or how he oversaw most of his killings. So that was done enough to kill about a hundred thousand people. 
Um, as the method of extermination developed, Ralph was transferred to Tunisia in the S, uh, with the SS in November of 1942. And he intensified the Nazis' policy against the Jewish people in the North African theater. So he just kept kind of doing the same shit. He ramped things up against Jews wherever he went. I'll kind of wait for TJ to get back because I don't want him to miss out on how oh, he's coming right back. No big deal. Thar's TJ. Thar she blows. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to grab a drink. No, it's all good. I didn't know if you were going to be gone long, so I paused for a second. It's um, all good. So in, the, in Ralph's diary, I think you can move to the next picture if you want. Okay. Uh, for instance, he wrote about a proposal from a German diplomat to use tens of thousands of Tunisian Jews as human shields against the oncoming Allied offensive. Uh, while Ralph disagreed with this measure, he did insist on the deportation of all Tunisian Jews over 18 years of age. It was about 70,000 people to labor camps, a lot of whom were killed in those camps. Uh, as Ralph fled North Africa before its capitulation to the Allies, he was stationed in Milan to assist Mussolini, another great guy, and uh, brought his, uh, you know, trademark savage measures against the Jewish population in that area. And he quickly uh, came under uh, that came under his jurisdiction for Mussolini. Yeah, yes, Paul. But how do you deal with the Jews? How's, how is it that you deal with them? Uh, what do you do with the Jews? Well, this guy had a very good idea what to do with the you have, Jews. You kill you them, you them, you round them up, and you send them to camps to be killed. I, I, dude, I thought it was uh, when you're talking about it was they're, they're using like Zycon and B on them. It's like no, they're making no. them fucking breathe, uh, breathe, breathe fucking exhaust fumes. That's that oh, carbon dude, that's monoxide, horrible. and yeah, that's horrible. Um, so by the time Germany collapsed in 1945 and Ralph's subsequent uh, detainment by U.S. forces in Milan, which you see here, this is him with some uh, U.S. people. He's in custody at this point. This is actually a picture of when he was officially detained by U.S. forces. Doesn't look um, too happy about it. Huh? I said he doesn't look too happy about it. No, he doesn't. Well, he shouldn't be. <laughs> but uh, as it turns out, he didn't have much to worry about. Um by the time of Germany's collapse, he was in uh, detainment in Milan on April 30th. It's estimated that the former naval naval officer was, like I said, responsible for directly the deaths of about 100,000 people, most mostly Jews. Uh, however, with the help of a bishop named Alwa Hudal, mm -hmm. Ralph was able to escape custody and the serving of any kind of justice. Uh, following a one-year stint at the Syrian Intelligence Department in Damascus in 1948, Ralph made his way to South America and joined a community of high-profile Nazi exiles. Another guy that we could have covered that would have been way more recognizable to you if you want to go to the next picture, TJ. <clears throat> Is there any of you recognize the gentleman in the center in the picture here? Um, um, yeah, I well, uh, I, I can see it in the document, too, so that, sure. that kind of helps. But uh, Joseph... Scotty's, Scotty's the only one that can't cheat. It's Joseph Mengele, so... And so Dr. Joseph Mengele, one of the most brutal Nazis, also joined uh, this, this Nazi and several other high-ranking Nazis in South America and various countries. Uh, cool. The gentleman we're talking about here today, Walter Ralph, ended up in Chile. Uh, he eventually took up a managerial role at a cannery factory no, near uh, the Chilean capital of Santiago in the 1950s. <laughs> the what are your qualifications? Beautiful. I love that. Uh, I love the, like, you know, he's just like, yeah, um, you want to be a manager at the can canning factory? Like, well, what kind of, uh, I'm sorry, the cannery factory? What, what kind of qualification? Well, I used to be a, a Nazi. I um, from the, oversaw from the death the of a hundred thousand people, you know? <laughs> To, to the, yeah, dude, going from the goddamn Riverian Alps or whatever, like the goddamn uh, mountains of Chile. I pulled the, uh, this picture because it was only a few miles from where uh, Walter Ralph lived and worked the rest of his life in a comfy managerial position in this beautiful fucking piece of country. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, despite the Federal uh, German Republic's knowledge of he and other Nazi members' whereabouts, he was able to live in relative peace until 1984 when he died of a heart attack, basically old age at 77, a ripe old age of 77, mm -hmm. lived a wonderful life in Chile, and uh, just kind of kicked it. Uh, there were attempts made 
to extradite this guy uh, back to Germany, such as in 1962, the Chilean Supreme Court rejected the claims. According to Chilean statutes, Ralph's offenses had been committed too long ago, so the statute of limitations was up. <laughs> oh, well, oh, we were on, on a hundred thousand deaths. Uh, ah, yeah, so. really sorry. Looking here, yeah, genocide up. Oh, statute of limitations up yeah. on genocide. Sorry about that. Hence, Walter Ralph was able to live the rest of his days in freedom and relative comfort, despite having been responsible for such destruction and savagery. This is Isn't a good. A this is a good story? Uh, story to bring up to anyone who fucking tells you about karma. Yeah, the, yeah. Where was this guy's fucking karma? <laughs> I guess they they would say, "Oh, the heart attack at seventy seven. Fuck you." <laughs> I don't know what they'd say. Well, they'd be like, they'd have to like at this point resort to like, "Well, he's in hell now" or something. But no, he lived a he li he lived a long, comfortable life. So I am sure people. that the both of you will recognize the next gentleman. Oh, uh, this is in poor taste, Paul. I am sure Poor taste. That you will recognize the next gentleman that we are going to talk about here today. This is, of course, Ted Kennedy, the lion of the Senate uh, era, to steal a bit from Howard Stern. Era, uh, I am Ted Kennedy. Yes. Um, so you guys uh, ever heard anything about uh, Ted Kennedy and the... Yeah. You ever heard the, you ever heard the term Chappaquiddick? I've never heard that specific. Uh, I mean, I, I've heard it, but I don't. I've never heard it used as a term. Chappaquiddick, TJ. Uh, but yeah, I know a little bit about this. Um, Chappaquiddick, TJ. Okay. Remember Chappaquiddick, TJ. I'll remember it. Is it like? Was it like the Benghazi of the time or something? <laughs> well, it was the Benghazi of the time, but something bad actually right. demonstrably happened. Okay. Well, something bad um, happened in, in Benghazi too. Which is, yeah. <clears throat> so I pulled this picture because it's a picture of people on the evening of July eighteenth, nineteen sixty nine. Mm-hmm doing what most Americans were doing that night, yep. sitting at home, watching their television, watching the progress of Apollo 11, landing on the goddamn moon. Hell yeah, dude. One small step for man. One Teddy, uh, Teddy Emma on Kennedy on. and his cousin Joe Goggin were ho hosting a cookout and a party at a rented cottage on Chappaquiddick Island, which is an affluent island near Martha's vine Vineyard, which if you've ever seen pictures of Martha's Vineyard, you know. I think I pulled one. Did you? Okay. The next picture, Martha's Vineyard. I don't know. Oh, it's one of the richest. Yeah. Uh, if there you not, go. Yeah. It's one of the richest zip code in the U.S. or one of them. Beautiful place. Mm -hmm. So he was having a cookout that night. Um, the party was planned as a reunion for Mary Jo Kopechny, who was the woman involved in this and five other women all veterans of the late senator uh, senator robert f kennedy's 1968 presidential campaign bobby kennedy and ted kennedy's older brother uh, or sorry was ted kennedy's older brother and following bobby's assassination in june 1968 ted took up his family's political torch so in 1969 ted kennedy was elected majority whip in the u.s senate and he seemed an early front runner for the 1972 Democratic presidential nomination. Just after 11 p.m. on this date, maybe as the, the astronauts were actually stepping out onto the moon, Kennedy decided to leave the party with Mary Jo Kopechny. And by his account, he drove. He, it was to drive uh, to the ferry slip where they were going to catch a boat back to their respective lodgings in Edgerton on Martha's Vineyard. Mm-hmm. While driving down the main roadway, Kennedy took a sharp turn onto unpaved Dyke Road, <laughs> Dyke drove for road. a short distance, and then missed the ramp to a narrow oh, wooden bridge. Oh, shit. And drove into Poocha Pond. Kennedy, a married man, mind you, at this time, let's not, let us not forget, and not married to the young lady that he was very innocently driving around mm -hmm. with. Of course. Night, by the way. Yeah, obviously. Claim the Dyke Road excursion was a wrong turn. However, both he and Kopechny had previously driven down the same road, which led to a secluded ocean beach just beyond the bridge. Oh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. the plot thickens. In addition, Kopechny had left both her purse and the key to her room at the party. Oops. An oversight. An oversight indeed, and one that would prove, unfortunately, deadly for Miss Kopechny. Because late that night, 
a black O's, uh, Oldsmobile driven by Senator Edward Kennedy plunged off the Dyke Bridge onto the tiny island of Chappaquiddick off Martha's Vineyard, landing upside down in the tidal Poucha Pond. The 37-year-old Kennedy survived the crash, but the young woman riding with him in the car didn't. Though newspaper headlines at the time identified her simply as a blonde, <laughs> her name was Mary Jo Kopechny. She was 28 years old. She was uh, actually a, uh, a respected sorry, political operative who had worked on the presidential campaign of uh, Senator Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy. Blonde, dead in crash. <laughs> right. She was blonde. Blonde. Senator, Ken okay. Blonde killed. Kennedy would later claim that he dove repeatedly into the strong and murky current to try and find Kopechny before he made his way back to the cottage. He drove back to the scene with his cousin, Joseph Gargan, according to him, and an aide of his, Paul Markleham, who both tried in vain to reach Kopechny. But rather than report the accident to the police at that time, Kennedy returned to his hotel in Edgerton. As a result, Mary Jo Kopechny remained underwater for nine hours until her body was recovered when the crash was finally reported the next morning. Uh... <clears throat> uh wait a minute <clears throat> yeah nine hours huh kennedy later claimed that he uh like i said he dove into the into the current um on july 25th kennedy pleaded guilty to leaving the scene of an accident and he received a two-month suspended sentence which those of you not in the know uh with legal jargon, it's a sentence that you get, but that is total bullshit because you don't have to serve it. Yeah, you know. So he served a two-month suspended sentence, which meant means he never went to jail. Uh, he had his license suspended for a year, mm -hmm. which I'm sure really hurt his rich ass, who probably was used to having. Well, I mean, in fairness to him, him uh, I do have it on good authority that uh, Ted Kennedy did suffer from the dreaded affluenza. So. Of course. Of course he did. You got to have that mitigating factor in place. Dude, this dude crashed this shit, got fucking scared, jumped the fuck out, and didn't even fucking check on the person he was with. And then clearly it was like, oh, Which shit, he I dived, he, up. he dived in to save her several times, Scotty. <laughs> several times. Shit, dude. He, di he dived back on to fucking land. I uh, dove into the strong and murky current several times until I had no wind left in me, Scotty. You weren't there. You don't know what happened. I tried to save Mary Jo Kopechny. I tried my tried hardest. Save, tried to save your fucking ass. A strong and murky currents of Pouch a Pond, which you know nothing about, Scotty. Your Pouch kind a Pond. Is, your kind has never been set foot on the holy soil of Martha's Vineyard, thank God. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> so you don't know the strong and deep and murky currents of Pouch a Pond, Scotty. Uh, I tried the, my the best. The the man. I did everything a man could do, Scotty, and I was so exhausted. The, the I picture, stumbled back to my hotel, Scotty, and slept for nine hours. The picture shows the car pretty much out of the water, though. Well, we can go back to that picture. It's them actually after they've discovered it, and they're pulling it out. Okay, so are they actually... Let, let's see the car again. Yeah, you can go back to the... So, yeah, they've, they've already... Yeah, there, there's like okay, a chain. Yeah, it's pulling, yeah, this, so it, it was, it pulling yeah, If underwater. you go forward, there's actually a picture of it as they found it, I think, upside down. I think I pulled that, too. Uh, go. Nope. No, I didn't. Well, it doesn't matter. It was upside you down. You didn't do it, me. Paul. You didn't do it. Um, so um, he said later the evening that her body was discovered that the delayed reporting of the accident was, quote, indefensible. But he vehemently denied that he'd been involved in any improprieties with Kopechny. He also asked his constituents to help him decide whether to continue his political career. Uh, you know, a sympathy move. It's like Brett Keane does this. Uh, if I should leave YouTube, just vote yes on this poll and I'll do it. It's the same thing. It's like, exactly. Era, tell me, please, if you don't trust me anymore, now I have fought for you. But Era, if you want me to leave politics, I will. And, of course, it worked for him. Uh, receiving a positive response, he resumed his senatorial duties at the end of a month. So he took basically, he basically paid for Mary Jo Kopechny's death with a month vacation from his Senate duties. 
I tragedy. also love I also love the fact that uh, when it came to um, you know like leaving the scene of the accident and stuff, he's like, "Listen, what I did there was indefensible," and people are just like. I like it. He took he took responsibility, but like, when it came to the affair that he was obviously having with her, there, he's like, didn't that didn't happen? Because that or whether would, or not he was drunk, that would have been the, that would have been the scandalous part. Or whether or not he was drunk, right? When this happened, and happened as a result of him being too drunk to be driving because he waited nine hours to report the crime. Well, but I just love the fact that uh, I just love the fact that he was like <laughs> the the big point of denial was like. I didn't. I mean, I wasn't trying to fuck. America her doesn't care about violence, though. Yeah, violence it's just like the okay. main thing people but are concerned did, about is like you, put your you weren't trying to stick your you dick in her, have? though, were you? No, yeah. I was just trying to drive her home. You know. But uh, ultimately, he did pay a price for this gentleman that we haven't mentioned. Well, he didn't get to be president. I will read this. There is speculation, and I laugh at that speculation that he used his considerable influence to avoid more serious charges that could have resulted uh, from this episode. Uh uh-uh. uh. I, I think that's a crazy, wild conspiracy theory type of I claim. Even, I don't even think we should. I mean, I can't even believe you'd even I, I, I that should here. have not pulled it, honestly. <laughs> uh, clearly pulled from a spurious source. Although the incident on Chappaquiddick Island helped to derail his presidential hopes, Kennedy continued to serve as a U.S. senator of Massachusetts into the 21st century. He died in 2009 while he was on the job. He was known as the Lion of the Senate. Yes. One of the most well-respected and revered left-wing liberal senators of his time. So while he uh, definitely derailed his chances of becoming uh, president, he went on to, uh, you know, serve a long and illustrious oh, yeah. term I mean, like, in the Senate. Uh, he fucking had a... Yeah, I mean, he was... And uh, to be honest with you, the way he was treated when he died, Mary Jo Kopechny's death was never brought up. He was lionized, uh, not to use a bad pun, because he was the lion of the Senate. But he lion was lionized, was lionized yes. <laughs> by his by his colleagues. And, uh, you know, had a big state funeral and the whole nine yards and basically got away with the probable murder by uh, at least manslaughter of yeah. a woman who basically didn't matter in the end. His political career and his wealth mattered more than her life. And he was never, never really faced any kind, anything I would call justice for the crime he committed that night. So. Not even close. Not even fucking close. I mean, but I mean, we that's a pattern we've seen kind of repeat. But at the end of the night. day, he was a Kennedy. So, I mean, like, did you really <laughs> expect anything to come of it? Do you have, <laughs> do you have fame? Do you have fortune? Do you have political power? You know, if you have certain things, it just seems like if you, if you check those boxes off, you get away with it. Also, I guess if you're a really clever serial killer, you also get away with it. Or just yep. a dude who goes around hitting people in the head with rocks, too. That, that seems yeah. like you get away with that, too. Or are, is are, that are, like maybe Ted method. Kennedy was the stone man. Yeah. We found it. We found we got another fucking uh, guy for you to look at. He's dead now, but he may have done it. Uh, so I will say this, and I know I say this about a lot of episodes, but I've been listening to uh, it a lot more often recently with the multiple episodes I've done of the cursed movies series. There's a lot more of this that I could have covered. I left a lot on the table, obviously. Oh, tonight. Sure. There are a lot of people who have gotten away with a lot of shit in various ways that were not even mentioned or referenced tonight. I'm sure you'll mention some of them in the comments, but if you enjoyed this episode, you like the way it turned out, let me know in the comments, wherever this ends up. And if you really, uh, if you enjoyed it, I'll do another one of these because I enjoyed pulling for it. I always like exposing these people. Well, not exposing them, I guess, but just marveling at the ineffectiveness of our judicial system. I can't believe you would say that, Paul. Well, the only thing, the good thing is that, uh, I mean, at least the justice system worked in the case of O.J. Simpson, so. (laughs) Okay, TJ. Go ahead and uh, die on that hill. I'm going to die on that. I'm going to be, I'm going to die on that hill, but you know what? If I do die on that hill, O.J. didn't do it. that fight. Deep bad fight Deep bad fight